All right, so we are getting started. Welcome to everybody to another EBFA webinar. Very excited for tonight's webinar. If this is your first time tuning in to a EBFA webinar, very special welcome. If you are a returning follower of EBFA's education, thank you for supporting us and following our education. Uh, tonight's the webinar is in association with or in uh, kind of a lead in or a tease to the fifth annual Barefoot Strong Summit, which is happening in Scottsdale, Arizona, this October 26, 27. It is also online. So there's online access to the okay. webinar, just in case if you do not want to go to Arizona or you cannot get to Arizona, you have online access. Before we get started into tonight's webinar, just a few business matters is first one, all of our webinars are recorded. So if you happen to jump off or you want to re-listen to this, you want to share it, all of the webinars are recorded and can be found on the EBFA YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. Uh, all of the webinars, we do a Q&A at the end. So if you have some sort of questions that you're coming up with or you uh, are thinking about throughout the webinar, you can type those in in the questions tab of the control panel. So if you scroll down, you'll see the questions. Just type it in. We'll go over those and make sure that we get those answered. All right. So we are getting started. Very special guest educator today. Uh, a a very interesting topic that um, started creating some buzz around social media when we were sharing it. People started speaking about their own um, birth experiences and some patterns that they actually saw in their own children, which was really uh, special to have people share and support what we're going to be talking about tonight with our guest educator, Jason Dvorak. Uh, so, Jason, very special welcome. Thank you for being part of EBFA's webinars. Thank you for having me. So, I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction, Jason, and then I'm going to pass the floor to you and have a incredible webinar. Thank so, you. Jason is the owner of Infants to Athletes Massage Therapy, which is located in Alberta, Canada. He is a practitioner and an educator. He works with all age groups related to injury, rehab, and pain management. He has a very special interest in birth trauma after a traumatic birth of his daughter seven years ago. Jason started to focus on newborn pain management and has been working towards advancing the understanding and knowledge based around the health and well being of infants related to birth shock and trauma very very personal topic uh just i gave birth five weeks ago it was not cesarean um and thankfully my daughter's very healthy but very close to home as far as birth topic jason thank you so much the floor is yours thank you emily um hello everybody i appreciate everybody listening in i hope you can hear me okay um, so yeah, today we're talking about some uh, cesarean birth. I chose cesarean birth just because it's it's more personal for me because my daughter was born this way, um, and she's basically what got me in into doing this. So, um, and just the first picture on the slide that touches our first language um, really is it's, we can do so so much good with with just touch, and we're gonna we're gonna touch on this a little bit. Um, and as Emily said, we're, we're kind of tying this into the Barefoot Strong Summit coming up in October, so can't wait to be there. Uh, there's a little bit of savings for you, so join up. Um, I want to go through a little bit about me too. Um, as Emily said, most of this, but owner and founder of Infant Style Athletes Massage Therapy in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Um, I got my fitness and exercise management diploma um, in 1999, so I was a uh, NSCA certified personal trainer uh, for a little while, kind of tying back to what uh, Ryan's, if anybody watched Ryan's webinar last week, he is also NSCA. So with that, I worked with a lot of NHL teams, um, players, university teams, so a lot of rehab, 
uh, injury management and all that kind of stuff. And then just putting together summer programs um, for the NHLers to get uh, ready for their next season. Um, I'm a graduate of West Coast College for Massage Therapy, which is in New Westminster, um, British Columbia. Uh, it's a 3,000 hour program for their massage therapy program. Um, passed my board exams in September of 2006, became registered uh, through the College of Massage Therapists of BC um, in October. Um, since then, I've taken way too many postgrad courses to list here. So, um, but there's the main ones for um, babies is some cranial sacral therapy, um, kind of learning from different physios, creating my own thing and, and going from there. Um, as explained before, my daughter was born cesarean, had a very traumatic birth, and we had a not so fun time for eight months. She was very colicky, and I will get into the what I think of colic and stuff uh, in a little bit. Very colicky, headachy, couldn't sit up straight, arching backs all the time, crying, 45 minutes of sleep, maybe, if we were lucky, at a time. Um, so lots and lots of work. So she's, again, why I got into this. Um, I'm an advanced orthopedic massage therapist, certified kinesio tape practitioner, and also an infant massage teacher. And recently just was on the director, uh, a director on the transitional council for the College Massage Therapy Association, which we're working to get uh, massage therapy regulated here in Alberta. So when people come to me with their babies, they sometimes have different views of what they, they're coming in for. And I wanted to go over what infant massage is versus what I do as treatment. So infant massage is fantastic. And going back to that first slide where it touches our first way of communicating. Um, infant massage, what I teach to parents is just to promote a more um, sort of the integrated, just to integrate everything physiologically, neurologically, psychologically, just growth and development. Touch is such, such an important thing for babies. Um, bonding between caregivers and babies, that can be anybody. It can be brother and sister. It can be grandmas. It can be aunts. It can be uncles, moms, dads, obviously, um, things like that. So um, helps to decrease the stress response, which we are going to learn about very soon. Um, Basically, 30 seconds of infant massage releases kind of the same amount of chemicals if you or I were eating some chocolate. Um, so babies get quite a bit out, even if you only get about 30 to 30 to 60 seconds. So if you're massaging a leg and they're done with it, um, you don't have to worry about them crawling in circles or anything like that. They will be okay and, and they will have a ton of benefit from it if you, as if you gave them 10 minutes of massage. So um, it's also very good for postpartum depression and moms. So when moms interact with their babies, um, it, there's studies out that say um, it really helps with postpartum depression um, to help facilitate the healing from that. And the biggest thing with infant massage, um, we're not working muscles. Infant muscles, I mean, they're, they're pretty non-existent. They're there, obviously, but we don't need to dig in our thumbs to a a tricep or a bicep or a back or things like that. So just focusing on touch, focusing on awareness, focusing on verbal communication, um, eye to eye contact and really making that connection with baby, um, which will stimulate a whole plethora of, of different things in them. When it comes to treatment, um, we're specifically working with the nervous systems, um, sympathetic, parasympathetic to decrease the tension in the body. And this is a thing where people go wrong with, they think we're working muscles. But when babies have birth trauma or birth shock, their fight or flight is, is jacked right up and we need to calm that down. And it's it's the fight or flight freeze kind of thing that, that will create all this tension through their body. And we're gonna to touch a little bit more on this later on. Um, we obviously assess bony and soft tissue anatomy. Um, we assess strain patterns that may have been caused, and you'll see some of that uh, in our live demo. Um, let me just see what else we got. CST, so cranial sacral therapy is what some of the things that I use, a little bit of cranial osteopathy, um, some fascial glides, communication through talking. Sometimes we just need to talk to babies. Um, we relive their birth trauma. We let them know that, yeah, you came into this world a little bit rough. 
um, but you never have to do that again. And we just kind of calm them down and they will scream their faces off. But as we continue to talk with them, they, they kind of get the message that everything's good and, and that screaming, that anger, that anxiousness kind of decreases. And we'll feel that through their breath, the length of time their cries are, the types of cries that they have. Um, it all changes just through simple talking. And then just using some simple holds for babies to unwind. And we're directly dealing with the birth shock and birth trauma, depending on what it is, whether it's been from cesarean birth, um, long labors, preterm, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different things that come up. So a little bit on cesarean birth rates. Uh, I got Canada and US, so Canadian Institute for Health Information. Um, Cesarean births were the most common inpatient surgical procedure in Canada last year, so 2018. That's over 103,000 births. So as we go through anatomy and the possibilities of what can happen, just keep that number in mind um, because it's, I think it'll open some eyes. Um, our cesarean rate was about 28.2%. The United States um, was 31.9%. So we're pretty close. Um, Florida had 31% um, and all of those were low risk. Um, I believe this, within the United States, 25% of the 31% um, were all low risk. So not necessarily needed, um, which is, yeah, as we go through this, you, you might uh, have your own opinions about it. Uh, World Health Organization, um, they want cesarean, they suggest cesareans to be at about 10 to 15%. So. We're quite a bit higher. I think Brazil has the highest, uh, and I'm not too sure about the rates, but it's it's climbing over 35%. So um, that's a lot of babies getting, not having a uh, more natural birth. A little bit of history, just a little quick graph. You can see cesarean birth rates uh, coming up from 5% in 1970, and now we're at that 31.9. And this is for the states. Um, VBACs, which is vaginal birth after um, cesarean. Um, so they had a big drop. A lot of hospitals in Canada won't do VBACs. Um, there could be a little bit of risk, but we, we do do them. So I'm not too sure what the rate is in the States. And the anatomy. So newborn skulls are obviously what we kind of look at the most um, because that's what usually presents to us uh, when birthing first. Um, and what I want you to pay a little bit of attention to is the jawline. Um, quite a bit different than ours are, obviously. Uh, the temporalis bone, um, the parietal bones, they're all kind of in this big line um, together. And uh, when we look at the top of the baby's head, we can see the fontanelles, um, the occipital fontanelles. The occiput is a bone in the back. Um, parietal bones are on each side. We've got the median um, fontanelle also. Um, occipital fontanelle usually closes within about a year, the first year of babies, uh, after baby's born. Uh, frontal can be closed at around two years and sometimes a little bit longer than it takes. So those are little things that we look at. And the reason for these fontanelles and why the, the skulls are not fused is um, just going through the birth canal, the, the bones of the skull do need to move. Um, in a new study that came out early this year, I believe, showed that they found baby skulls go through three times more pressure uh, than they originally thought. So there's a lot of shifting, a lot of moving um, of the skull bones. Sometimes they overlap each other, which creates all this pull through that membranous um, connective tissue there. Um, and as we dive in deeper to the anatomy here, you'll, you'll see what it can um, possibly eventually lead to. Um, at the back of the skull, the picture on the left is the occiput. Um, it is not fused also in newborns. Um, so as you can see, the blue is just more membranous. Um, the basilar part that you see there, and I'm just gonna back up uh, really quick here. The basilar part, if you look at the mastoid fontanelle uh, in the newborn skull, basilar part of the occiput comes down from that. Uh, and then will attach to the sphenoid. So the body of the sphenoid is right in the center. So if we think of a forceps birth, 
square, and again, going back, forceps, if you look at the where the eye socket is, a lot of times forceps will be just um, posterior to the eye socket, um, and baby will be pulled from that. That is exactly where you can access the sphenoid bone. So if sphenoid bone gets twisted or torqued or pulled in any way, that body can be turned, which then with the basilar part of the occiput can affect how it sits properly. And then off of that is basically the spine. So the third picture here, we have the ethmoid bone. Um, this is an adult skull. The ethmoid bone, um, the sphenoid bone, and then the basilar part. So you can see the occiput and the basilar come quite a bit underneath. When we go to the first picture, it's quite a bit more straight in line. With babies, all these, the ethmoid, sphenoid, and occiput, or the basilar part of the occiput, is basically a big continuation of the spine. So we will see a lot of stuff going on in the spine, um, especially like babies that arch their back a lot. Um, a lot of dural tightness um, that occurs from that. Um, let me just see what else I got in my notes here for you guys. Um, yeah, so facial nerves coming out also, um, forceps birth can affect that. <clears throat> and then within we've got dura. So dura is just that fascial web within the cranium. Um, includes a tentorium cerebelli, falx cerebri, and the anterior girdle. Um, strain by any means, so it could be a long birth uh, where babies being, with each contraction, being pushed through the vaginal canal. Uh, if they're stuck, um, that can create a lot of pressure through the dura, um, which can impede venous flow and, and result in some headaches or just a lot of pressure um, through the baby's skull. Strain within the cranial vault may result in functional strain patterns later on in life. So we look at scoliosis because membranes um, basically create the meninges that go all the way down the spine. Um, and that's where we've got a pretty good, pretty strong adhesions, not adhesions, sorry, connections to C1 and C2. And then again at S2 uh, are the strongest points where the meninges connect uh, to the spine. So at those points, those can be big points of dysfunction. Um, through the rest of the spine, it's not as strong of a, a attachment just because we want to keep mobile and flexible and if it's too strong we're not going to be able to bend forward and, and so on and so forth so um, and strain patterns can also happen bottom up so it depends on some of the things that uh, happen in birth there so back to cesarean births after that um, cesareans can be and are necessary um, most of the time well a lot of times they, in my opinion, aren't. I think we need a little bit more education on proper positioning, um, allowing women to have the choice of birthing on their back, which is like the most horrible position for a birth to occur. Um, they should be, you know, knees or, or things like that. But um, so cesarean births are, are necessary. <clears throat> they will usually have a lower APGAR score, the cesarean birth baby. APGAR is just an acronym. Um, all it is is appearance, pulse, grimace, um, or their reflexes, uh, activity, and respiration. So APGAR is checked at one minute after birth, uh, and it's basically just seeing how baby handled birth, and then at five minutes. Um, and after five minutes, it's basically seeing how baby's handling being out of mom's womb. So low APGAR scores, uh, seven and above is good. You'll probably rarely get a 10 um, in APGAR and rarely, especially with cesarean, you're gonna have a low APGAR score um, within the first minute. And then they, it gradually comes up just depending on if there was a lot of birth trauma. Um, if they are below seven, it doesn't mean that it, the baby is not healthy, but uh, there may need some medical intervention. Um, and again, comments, cesarean births, long births, high risk, premature deliveries, all that kind of stuff. OBs or surgeons have about 10 to 15 seconds in just a regular um, cesarean birth if it's non emergency. Within an emergency, it's about 8 to 10. <clears throat> um, and they pull whatever. Babies aren't in there all nice and 
you know, reaching up and saying, hey, how you guys doing? Come on, pull me out. Um, they will find what they can. And of course, they're going to be as gentle as they can. But because in emergency cesareans, they have to get baby out because mom is um, exposed and can be uh, have infection. Baby can have infection. Um, and in true emergencies, something's going on with baby. So they got to take care of baby uh, as soon as possible. There could be other modalities used like a vacuum or a ventuse or forceps. Now forceps aren't usually used in cesareans or usually have been used, um, but they won't be using them once um, mom has been um, cut open and, and baby's being pulled out. Vacuums, however, can be. And there's a tremendous amount of strain. You've all seen pictures of babies with the big cone heads and stuff like that. Tremendous amount of strain through that. Um, with the pulling there. The baby's not gonna go through their natural birth process. Um, I think we're programmed to birth. Mom and baby work together, depending on the factors such as positioning, um, the size of mom's pelvis, size of baby's head, um, and all this can disrupt the, that natural birth process. Um, cesarean births are super stressful on babies. Um, if you think of the uterus as a water balloon, and depending on, you know, again, if it's emergency or not, or how much time the surgeon has, they might make a very quick cut and you've got a big pressure change. So if we think of coming up from the ocean floor too quick, obviously it's not this extreme, um, but there's a big pressure change that they go through. Um, and these long-term effects haven't uh, really been adequately, adequately studied um, on cesarean births. So that's what I'm hoping to kind of accomplish through all this. So how do we know if they have some struggles or if they're not happy babies and what's wrong with them? And a lot of times we'll go to doctors and doctors are amazing, but sometimes they just don't have the answers. And a lot of times it comes up with colic symptoms or things like that. But um, babies that are inconsolable, there's something going wrong, you know, and, and babies are babies are gonna cry, but there's something when you are, doing everything you can and they just don't calm down, they're talking to you and telling you that something's going on. Poor sleep habits, poor latching, that's due to the tension because their fight or flight is just jacked up from birth and, and that body just hasn't released any of that tension um, to allow that jaw to drop, to allow the tongue to uh, come out and, and um, get under the nipple for proper breast, breastfeeding. Arching of the back is a big one. If babies are lying on their backs or they don't like to sit and they just arch back, a lot of people will hold them and they'll arch or babies will look up. Um, you'll get a lot of, you know, babies so strong because their, their neck, look at them, hold up their head. They're so strong. They're not strong. They're trying to get away from some of that discomfort. Some of it has to do with them learning about their bodies and getting muscle activation. But a lot of times at that two to four week phase, they are just trying to decrease some of that pressure. Hands up by their head, if they're constantly at their head, not in a sleeping position, but if they're kind of just playing with their ears a lot or pulling at their head or tapping their head, that's a possibility of headaches. Wide eyes, um, babies are, when they're a cesarean birth, they come into a world of chaos. There's lights, there's people talking, there's people grabbing them, they're, they're running around, uh, cold air right away. They are on alert constantly after that if, if we haven't been able to calm down um, with mums uh, with breastfeeding and stuff like that. Gassy or poor, poor bowel movements so colicky increased irritation at certain points of the body so pulling over um, onesies over the head if baby had some trauma on the head they will freak out and not like it. Um, if they had a short cord um, they will have a lot of strain patterns going one way with some rotational through their thoracic and we'll get into that very soon and cluster feeding too cluster feeding is a big one because not only does feeding mold the cranium because of the pressure but it also takes pressure away so when babies are cluster feeding it, it decreases some of the pressure in their cranium if they've had headaches and stuff like that the other thing um, that it also does is mom's breast milk actually becomes kind of an analgesic to them so if they're in pain and they're cluster feeding a lot, that's the reason their their breast milk sort of becomes that analgesic and it makes them feel better. So twofold, the analgesic happens and then you know the pressure in their cranium starts to decrease, uh, which is what we kind of want. 
Um, they could be going through growth spurts, obviously, but it uh, just depends on when that kind of stuff happens. Um, so why do these occur? So definitely not a natural birth. Um, there's a long labor in a head down position, so they get a lot of pressure through the head down, and then all of a sudden that they're they're pulled out. Um, there's a short umbilical cord. Um, the umbilicus actually creates the falciform ligament of the liver. So if there's a short cord or if it's wrapped around the neck um, or if it's pulled when, when baby's born, that can create a strain pattern through the liver, which then with the ligamentous um, attachments into the diaphragm and the thoracic, thoracic spine, that can create strain patterns later on in life too. Um, depending on the modalities used, if they had a bontuse, which is the vacuums or the forceps, how many times did the vacuum come off uh, or the forceps, how many times did they have to do it? The pressure change, like I explained earlier, um, and baby's natural birth instincts are, are totally disrupted in a cesarean birth. Um, different strain patterns caused by handling at birth, so sh shoulder dystocia or um, pulling on the leg, so hip patterning can, can occur. Pulling on the neck, that's another big one, so possible torticollis. Um, I don't like to say it's a true torticollis, but it can happen where baby just favors that one side. Their first breath is usually delayed, so they don't get that big, ex excuse me, expansion of their rib cage. Um, so that can create a lot of discomfort for baby. So a lot of gas can be created by that. Skin to skin may be delayed, feeding may be delayed. Um, any drugs that are used during labor um, can uh, affect cesarean births and any births for that matter. And again, they're born into chaos. So their fight or flight on all of these is just jacked right up. And, and our job is just to try and calm that down so that tension in the body can, can alleviate themselves. So we always go through birth stories. Uh, was it a plan or emergency C-section? What happened to baby to, to have this happen? Um, there's D-cells, was your breathing off? Um, did they stop breathing? Um, did mom have to, did they have to do it because mom was, um, having troubles. Um, we look for visuals, just the alertness of baby, quality of movement, bilateral symmetry, um, how baby holds him or herself in the tone, and any abnormalities. So talking about the liver, um, when baby feeds, we should see usually a bulging on their left side where their stomach is. Now, if you see a bulging on the right side, we know that the liver has been, or the, the cord has been yanked, and it's created the strain pattern. So fascially everything wants to pull into that right side and it's more predominant um, when baby feeds so that's an it's an easy easy way to look at at babies and, and see if, if the cord has been pulled um, obviously palpation just skin we're looking for temperature in different areas um, how it moves joint mobility cervical mobility and, and just the dura again and i'm going to show some of this in our little live demo and then audio and visual, what types of cries are they having? Um, do they grimace when we talk about different things um, or do different things with them or touch different areas of their body? Do they have a little bit of a, a different cue for you? So, um, so we look at all that kind of stuff. All right, so I'm gonna go get my live demo really quick. We're gonna do like maybe three to five minutes of different stuff and then uh, we'll come back and finish this off. So just give me one second and I will be right back. <clears throat> Let's see if this works. So we're back. Hopefully you can see me. There I am. Hello, people. All right. So I have Corbin here today. And Corbin was not cesarean birth, but that's okay because he had a lot of stuff going on. Um, Corbin was born with his arm above his head. Um, he had his cord wrapped around his neck. He had a very fast delivery. It was about 15 minutes, so that's it's actually okay, but it's still a little bit quick. So long deliveries and fast deliveries aren't very good for them. Um, very high risk pregnancy coming from, and he was also three weeks early. So I saw Corbin first in June when he was four months old. He's now seven months old. Came in with colic symptoms, and colic to me is just just symptoms of tightness. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple quick demos, demonstrations of what we do and then uh, we'll go from there and we'll just see because babies are babies, they might cry and we'll, we'll go from there. So I'm gonna see if we can see the treatment area. Whee, all right. 
All right, dude. And I get really silly with babies, so don't mind me because it's just fun. Ready, buds? <gasps> Yay! Come on, buds. Oh, you look tired. Oh, no. This is perfect. Yes, this is my little man. And they are all mine when they come in. So Corbin was not calm like this when he first came in. He was freaking out and crying and not sleeping. And within one treatment, we had him settled. So we are going to go over here and hopefully you can see. Hi, buds. Hi, buds. What are you doing? Can we lie you down? Thank you. And we should be able to see. Good. So quickly, we're going to do this. And I'm so happy you're here. How are you doing? All good? We get a smile today. Mm -hmm. So dural tightness, one way we do it, we look for rotation. Shoulder doesn't come up on that side. Rotation here, shoulder doesn't come up on that side. I believe I have to review my notes. I think his left shoulder was coming up quite a bit. Um, his right shoulder was not. So we just went to the right side, or sorry, to the uh, side of ease and it just calmed that area down and then that corrected itself. And they're very quick corrections. Then we bend you in half, don't we? Yeah. You're just chill, dude. So when yeah, when we first did this, Corbin had about that much mobility. I should be able to get knees and ankles above their head, and I don't go all the way above because it freaks parents out. <laughs> but we can now really get him into a good um, dural stretch. So he's got lots of freedom in his dura. He had that umbilicus uh, that was really stuck, which was probably creating a lot of his colic symptoms. So we treated a lot of the strain patterns through here and even putting my hand on his tummy, he would kind of not be liking it, but you're good now, aren't you? Yes, it might be, yeah, because you're like passing out. Hey. <laughs> um, and then we just shake the hips. We look at a few things and then we're gonna go to the head because you had a strain pattern last week and we want to look at that. Wee! All right. So looking at the cranium, baby's heads move really well. Hi, buddy. And you can see, well, you won't be able to see what my hands are doing or feel them, but there is a little bit of a rotation. So Corbin's head kind of does this. So it's, it's amplified in my hands. It doesn't really like twist, um, but you can feel a little bit of, of stuff that goes off. And we just kind of bring it into the end feel of it and we kind of hold it. So we're not moving the bones of the body, but we just hold that area and eventually you just feel a big release or they will take a nice deep breath like you just did because you're so mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and this was not allowed in the first session either. He hated his head being touched um, just because fast births can create a lot of pressure through the cranium and anybody touching his head, he just did not like. So he was good and now he's sleeping pretty good. He's very calm now, obviously. Yes, you are, right? I know. And, this is another thing that he likes to do. So babies will show me where they are sore and you probably can't see, but his hand on this side is grabbing at my finger, which is a sign that there's something going on there. And we won't treat that because we're, we're running out of time, but um, we'll treat it another time. Yeah, cool, cool, okay. <laughs> so we look at the facial features. Um, we treat through here. We have little flies that land, yes. Um, I know there's something there, but. Um, we treat all fascial through there. We never undress babies. Um, it's all through palpation. Um, we give little ear pulls, but we just watch what they're doing. And uh, they're a lot of fun and they really, really respond well. So usually I can get babies to be calmer within one session. Sometimes it takes two or three, but after that, then they're good to go and, and latching becomes easier and, and a whole bunch of stuff. Cool? Thanks, buds. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna get back to mom. Yeah. You wanna say bye? Say bye to everybody. Bye bye. Yes, I know that's pretty cool. Okay. If you can make that would be awesome. It won't be too much longer. Okay, guys. So let's go back to this. I'm gonna turn that off. And then, so what happens to babies after treatment? 80% um, of them go to sleep for a long time. So the first 24 to 48 hours, babies sleep a lot. Um, so I get mums to check on them. Nothing's going to happen, but they do need to feed. So once they wake up, they go back to sleep pretty easily. And that's just due to a lot of the energy expenditure that, uh, with treatment, because they do all the work. We, or I just facilitate the ba the body to, to, to kick in. Um, and then 20% are very cranky and irritable over 24 to 48 hours. And then those are the ones that take a little bit longer. 
changes that occur. They're more relaxed, increased bowel movements because of the relax, um, less sensitivity, um, easier, better latch, better sleep, more alert, not on guard, uh, more time between irritation with less time being irritated. Um, and sometimes there's no change or they will be worse. And that's okay because that tells another story and we just got to dig in a little bit deeper. But that's all because we've decreased that fight or flight system and the body is now allowed to mobilize and uh, create a lot more laxity in a lot of this stuff. Recent study, um, this is where I want to go, is, is my interest was ADHD and ADD and I fell upon this study like yesterday kind of thing. And cesarean births, they suggest, are associated with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit. So why is this? Is there a hormonal change? Is there, you know, is it because of the pressures through the cranium? Um, who knows, but it, it'd be really interesting to see what they, where they go with this study. And this is literally in August, I believe, uh, of this year. So if strain patterns aren't identified, again, what happens to the hormonal response as we grow up? What happens to the soft tissue response? Um, can it create a scoliosis pull, um, stress response? Uh, in vitro fertilized um, pregnancies are very anxious. Babies are very high anxiety for some reason, and, and I'm not too sure why. But um, yeah, so that's another thing, like what's going on with that part of it? And then the physical response. So how does that trauma affect them presently and how will it affect them later on if it's not treated um, because it also affects parents in, in quite a bit different different ways so um, because it's, it is hard when a baby's crying non-stop and you don't know what to do and sometimes doctors just say they'll grow out of it and we will we all did all of us grew out of everything but we had eight months that were horrible for our parents you know um, so a lot of that but that is about me. So, so in conclusion, with cesarean births, it's very hard on babies. It's very stressful on babies. It's very stressful on mom. And we take that into consideration too, because her stress will, the baby will feed off stress later on. Um, and my goal is to figure out all of these whys. What can we do? Is it these strain patterns? Is it this type of birth that will create this kind of stuff? And uh, how can we can we get this into hospitals? Can we get this type of treatment? Because it's very, as you saw with Corb, and I didn't do a lot, but it's just simply putting your hand on their head and you feel so much movement and you just have to trust your hand, but then you just facilitate the movement. You're not moving the bones of the skull, but you're just facilitating the proper, um, proper mobility that they should have. Um, so, yeah, hopefully in, in the summit, this is just, like I said, a little teaser, but we're going to delve into a little bit more of the emotional response, both through what the babies might be going through and, and how moms and dads and grandparents and families are affected by it, um, and how we can possibly create treatment plans uh, that can help that and help everybody succeed and make babies' lives quite a bit easier because any type of birth, even the most, the best birth possible, vaginal, natural, everything goes perfect, is trauma. And birthing is our first trauma that we have. So if it's, you know, it's different, it's not a natural birth, then I think there's even more trauma, such as a cesarean birth, because it takes us out of our, our natural ability to be born. So a lot of changes um but yeah i'm we're at almost 40 minutes here so i will give it back to emily um that's my info there and uh i will answer any questions excellent thank you so much jason um mm -hmm. I, I would say that for the listeners who may say that they're not working with children uh newborns or or babies that this could be tied into some of their history profile on their adult clients to better understand their full profile of trauma experiences or emotional experiences with birth, as you had said, being the first one. Um, yeah. So I thought that it's it can, very powerful. Sorry, Emily. It can def yeah, it can definitely tie into, I mean, there's more studies coming out that 
trauma can be carried on um, emotionally um, through generations. Um, and there's, you know, if there has been birth trauma and we're dealing with an athlete that can't rotate properly and there's been no um, other signs of stress or, or injury, where is it coming from? You know, yeah. so if we've had a lot of uh, birth trauma, we maybe need to go back to that. Is it harder to fix? It might be, but at least if we if we have that open mindedness, we can kind of look at things a little bit differently, a little outside the box, and and try and and focus through there. Yeah, no, I think that that's um, great. I ask uh, a lot of people on their earliest experiences, as far as you know, how is their relationship with their their mother or their caretaker? But really, those questions should actually go a little bit before that and be involved in the birth. Um, so very, very thought provoking. Um, and I'm totally going to do some of those dural tightness movements on my daughter. Mm -hmm. I'm not sleeping, but um, <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm just curious. And then at the summit, you said that you're going to uh, take a look at her, which would be amazing. And you can I would love to. And she could be your your sample or your model patient uh, during your session at the summit. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, if anyone has any questions, please do type those in. And then, as Jason had said, he has a session at the summit, which will be much more in detail. He'll have some hands on there as well. Um, it's going to blend in perfectly with the rest of the Brain Awakening series that we have on Saturday. Uh, we are going into the autonomic nervous system, polyvagal theory, understanding somatic experiencing. So this is perfectly in line with the rest of the schedule and what the other presenters are going to be speaking on. Um, while you guys are possibly thinking of any questions um, or if it's uh, processing in your mind and you have a question that you want to email Jason about, please do that. His email is here. Um, I do have a quick question um, as far as the umbilicus. Mm -hmm. Do you or have you ever seen uh, when there's a sinus? So uh, any, any infants or newborns in your practice that have um, the continuation of the umbilicus either to other structures within the GI system or it'll be uh, like a sinus that's then like blind. It doesn't connect to anything, but it's, it's still a sinus. That's a good question. I Mostly what I see is just strain patterns. So when we do like the rotational component with the dura, we're trying to get some rotation through a little bit of the lumbar spine, but mostly um, thoracic spine, and also checking diaphragm. Um, diaphragm obviously is our big breathing muscle, but if there's tension through it, we're not going to have that ability to mobilize the baby's knees to one side or the other. Um, and if there is, if they had a short cord or if it was pulled and there is a strain pattern and we have those connections through the liver, I, I don't doubt that there are more fascial restrictions through um, like the intestines and, and other areas in the body that would create a lot of um, symptoms, such as colic and, and things like that. So, so mostly I, what I see is, is just more the strain patterns that are happening. I haven't seen too many major things that, that it could possibly create, but... Okay. Um, I have one more question. Uh, yeah. What is the uh, pattern that you see when an adult, or it could be a child as well, doesn't like their belly button touched? Does mm. that, have you seen that? This is totally personal. I don't, I don't like having my belly button no. touched. <laughs> it's, it's actually really painful to me. So I'm... I'm curious if perhaps during my birth, I had a short umbilical cord or adhesions or yeah. something from that. You know what? That is, 
I am going to take that up and see because that's an interesting question. I've never even thought about that. And and um, my wife has her. She hates her umbilicus touched. Hates <laughs> it. Or her belly button. Whereas my daughter, she can she bugs me and she will pull that thing out and be like, look at me, dad. And it's just the grossest thing ever. And <laughs> I don't like my uh, belly button touch, too. So but I know my birth was just very quick. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about the cord. But that's a very cool question, Emily. I'll, I, you know what? I'm going to have an answer for you at the summit because uh, okay. I'm going to look into that. That would be awesome. I did ask a craniosacral therapist who was referencing something about the midline of the mm -hmm. body and how a lot of kind of energy and uh, the balancing of emotions is through the midline of the body. So she didn't have a direct answer, but was kind of like, oh, you you really need to address that because it's in your midline. So it emotionally like, are you housing some of your emotional tension within your umbilicus? I don't know. Um, well, well, a lot of, when you do cranial, a lot of, we have, for me, I warn people if I'm going through their um, stomach area or their abdominal area, that's where a lot of deep trauma is held. Mm -hmm. And when you start to release fascial or when you start to get some release, you will have some emotional releases that, that happen. And those emotional releases could be anger, they could be laughter, they could be full on crying and sobbing and the people don't know where it's coming from. And you have to warn people because you don't know if that will spiral them into a little rabbit hole that they can't kind of get out of because their body might not be able to, to handle that yet. Um, so she's right, like there's a lot of, of emotional trauma that gets held there. So with babies, if they've had a lot of physical trauma, and we're going to delve into the while they're in the womb at the summit, but um, they start feeling pain about 18 to 20 weeks within the womb. So that could be emotional and all that. And depending on how pregnancy was for mom, was it um, was there any physical assault? Was there any uh, mental assault? Um, anything? Was there a lot of stress? The baby's going to pick that up. So can baby hold on to that um, through birth and then hold on through it the first couple of years? I don't know, but a lot of stress um, will be held. And, and working with baby's tummies, they do get a lot of increased anxiety in the sense that they don't know what's going on and they really don't want it and they will scream their face off. <laughs> so, so there's something that goes on in my um uh, opinion in the stomach area that will hold a lot of emotional tension for them yeah and where it comes from I'm not too sure with with birth right now right so fascinating thank you so much mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone for tuning in um, and again please don't forget to check out the barefoot strong summit both online and live access so if you are not able to um, be in Arizona on these dates you do not want to miss out on really powerful topics such as what Jason is going to be speaking of and the other presenters you can save $50 online or live either of the access um, or summit uh, uh, styles by using code webinar head to barefoot strong summit and you'll see registration for both of those thank you again jason so much this is really i'm very uh selfishly fascinated in this topic so i really <laughs> thank appreciate you for having me yes good thank you everyone have a great night or a great day depending where in the world you are